Okay, so we came up with those equations, and we were using gamma and omega naught and omega d for the various things. We're going to introduce today damping ratio. Okay, now damping ratio, you should be aware of what damping ratio is. It's uh, simply the, the damping that you've got divided by the damping that would result in critical damping. Now we know that critical damping is when you've got your natural frequency equal to omega, uh, sorry, gamma divided by 2. If you remember the equation that we had uh, in the tutorial uh, for omega d, um, these were different, okay? Um, but obviously if they're the same, you end up with what's known as critical damping. And so by knowing that equation, we can plug that in, um, you know that gamma is c upon m, you can plug that in, um, and omega naught is root k upon m, you can plug that in, it gets the critical damping, which is 2, root mk, okay, and then you can um, rearrange to get uh, the damping ratio, okay, c divided by 2 root mk. The damping ratio is an important quantity because it will help us, if just by looking at the damping ratio, it helps us know whether our system is damped, um, under damped, or over damped, or whether we're at critical damping. If it's under 1, okay, we know we have what's known as under damping, Okay, but if it's over one, we have overdamped system. Okay, and if it's equal to one, we've got critical damping. So it's quite a quick way to show what sort of damping we've got in the system. The relationship between damping ratio and gamma can be determined by first determining C in terms of gamma. So if we've got we've got our equation for damping ratio, if we rearrange the equation for C. You end up with 2 um, zeta root mk, okay, and obviously root mk is m to the half, k to the half. And so we can go, therefore, from, we know the gamma is c upon m, so if we stick in what we've got for c at the top here, we've got 2 zeta m to the half, k to the half, over m, well m to the half over m is 1 over m to the half, so that's why that drops down, and you can see we've ended up with 2 zeta root k upon m, which is 2 zeta omega naught. And so wherever we saw gamma in that equation, okay, we could replace with 2 zeta omega naught, which is the, other, the alternative form. And last week we also covered a term Q, okay, which is the quality of oscillation. If you remember, a low Q meant that we had a high damping, and a high Q meant we had low damping. If you've got a high quality oscillator, then it oscillates very nicely. Okay, so we can again, we know, um, Q we defined last week as omega naught divided by gamma. Again, knowing gamma is C upon um, M, and uh, um, you can plug in the same sort of stuff. Well, in fact, you can just plug in this, okay, into here. The omega naught's cancel, you end up with 1 upon 2 zeta. So again, if zeta is high, okay, if you've got a high damping, then Q is correspondingly low. And obviously, if zeta is low, then you've got a correspondingly high Q. Okay. So if you want to relate Q and, uh, and damping ratio, then this is the equation to use. This is the equation we use quite a lot in the uh, tutorial, equation 2.25. And like I said, when you've got... Um, when you've got critical damping, omega naught squared and gamma squared upon 4 are equi equal to each other, okay? Um, but, uh, but in this case, we're not, uh, we're not doing that. Omega d is defined as um, uh, omega naught squared um, <coughs> minus gamma squared upon 4, all square rooted, which obviously makes sense. And what we can do is we can rearrange. We can, as, instead of gamma squared, we can put 2 squared, which is 4, zeta squared, and omega naught squared into this equation. Okay? And you can do some rearranging. The 4s will cancel. Okay? So you have omega naught squared minus zeta squared uh, minus omega naught squared. Well, there's an omega naught squared in both of those terms, so that can come out um, down here, and you end up with 1 minus zeta squared. Um, sorry, square rooted. So omega d, that's, this is the other form of omega d you may have seen before, okay? Uh, which is perfectly valid as well. And often, that'll be the form that you'll use, because you'll have the damping ratio, or, or you'll work it out, instead of the equation that we used in the tutorials. <coughs> so that's damping ratio. <coughs>
Moving on to talk about amplitude and frequency ratio, we did cover this slightly last week when we talked about when we looked at the uh, the um, graphics that go with that. <coughs> Damping ratio is defined as m, okay, and that's the amplitude over the the amplitude at static load. Okay, now static load we covered last week. Basically, that's the spring equation. Okay, um, that's a deflection. Okay, when a is a deflection, a equals f of f naught upon k. Obviously, you multiply both sides by k, you end up with k times a, which is the <coughs> displacement equals the force. Kx is the force, yeah, force in the spring, and so you end up with this equation. That's the static load. If you've got another amplitude, okay, that's a certain way away because you're looking at different frequencies, to get the amplitude ratio, you divide it by the static deflection, okay, the static load. Okay, so you end up with a times k divided by f naught. And so obviously at a zero frequency, we talked about how the amplitude was 1, or the amplitude ratio was 1. Obviously as the amplitude goes up, so does the, uh, uh, the, the amplitude ratio. Okay? And then obviously as, uh, as you cross over the, um, the uh, natural frequency you're at, or you're close to a peak, and then obviously as you increase the frequency, the amplitude drops down to 0. Okay? And so obviously this term will also drop down to 0. Frequency ratio is a similar, similar concept. It's about relating the frequency at which you're oscillating a system at with the natural frequency of the system. Okay? So when you're, obviously when your frequency is very, very low, this number is also very low. When your frequency is very high, then obviously um, this number is also very, very high. And when your frequency is very, very close to omega naught or at omega naught, then obviously R is going to equal 1. And so you can plot, if you remember when we were looking at a uh, damped, um, forced oscillation, then you can end up with these equations. And this is what we had last week, like this when I mentioned M and R in passing, but like I said, this is showing it in, um, yeah, yeah, with a bit more clarity, hopefully. Okay, so at zero, um, frequency is very close to zero, we end up with just a static deflection, okay, because the system's not, essentially not oscillating. Obviously, as you increase the frequency um, to around one, you end up with getting a peak, and that peak will depend upon how much damping you've got. Okay? If you've got low damping, then you end up with a very high peak. And if you remember, if you had zero damping, then it actually shoots off to infinity. But damping will, it will introduce, you know, will, will limit that um, ability to go off to infinity. Okay? And all real systems are damped, so you never actually go off to infinity. Um, but obviously, that's a massive deflection, um, uh, which may be damaging. To see. But anyway, so it's damping in the system. And then, uh, then obviously, as you go past one, um, the amplitude will then tail off. It'll cross back over. It'll be smaller than the uh, than the static load, and then it will slowly decrease down to zero as your frequency ratio goes up. And then with delta, which is the phase, okay, you start off. Things are moving in the same direction, and as you increase up to a, a omega equaling omega naught, then you've got a 90 degree phase shift. So things are lagging behind by 90 degrees. Okay, and then as you go beyond that point, you end up approaching pi in terms of phase shift, so things are actually moving in the opposite direction there, 180 degree out of phase with the, uh, with the input. So that's giving you a detail of M and R. <coughs>